Let's get underway. So, yeah, so this is all about um, ammonia safety in PPE. So first of all, I just uh, wanted to tell you a little bit about ASTI. So ASTI is a 501c3 non-profit training organisation based in California. And uh, we train lots of people on North America, South America and Australia. Um, I'll just go to... So the, the SD program was started by uh, a fire chief, an American fire chief in the 1980s. Um, when he discovered that he had a, um, a very high concentration of ammonia refrigerated facilities in his jurisdiction. And he ran into a number of accidental releases from those ammonia refrigeration plants, which uh, he felt he was very ill-equipped to deal with. And also at that time, um, in the USA, they were averaging um, 10 fatalities per year from ammonia refrigeration issues uh, of un, you know, accidental releases, which he just found incredible that it was such a disastrous, risky environment for people to work in. So he uh, started ASTI. And uh, so the important thing about that is ASTI was not started by industry people, it wasn't started by engineers, it wasn't started by anyone. It was started by a fire chief. It was started by the emergency response people. And uh, it's grown to this. Now, ASTI, basically, we train what we call a tripod. So we train um, industry, government and public safety people. So... Uh, Obviously, in every training program we run for ASTI, no matter at which level, we try to include those three, at least those three uh, groups. So in the, the Australian uh, context, we have uh, industry people, which is you know everybody who's using ammonia or got ammonia in their facilities. The government people would be um, the regulators, the uh, work safe organisations in each state um, and any other um, government entities that um, need to be involved, EPA, um, you know, all kinds of other groups. And then, of course, the, pu the public safety. So the public safety are the emergency response community, fire brigades, um, but also hazmat groups, um, all kinds of different public safety, like, for instance, we train with uh, Queensland Fire and Rescue, you know, who are probably one of the most equi equipped... Oh, sorry. I'm out of shot, am I? <laughs> yeah, you're in shot. <laughs> uh, one of the best equipped groups in Australia to deal with uh, accidental ammonia releases through the, the science... science uh, uh, head guy up there, um, uh, Dr. Mike Logan, who we know quite well. So um, that's, that's the situation for ASTI. Now, what we're finding is that now that um, ammonia is being considered for um, uh, use in the uh, uh, energy industry and much wider use, we really need to ramp up our public training, our public uh, uh, offering, our public education, so that we can achieve um, much better 
uh, social licence for ammonia facilities and for ammonia in general. Now, having said that, I should tell you that um, the social licence for ammonia is far more uh, widespread, you know, the acceptance of ammonia in the community um, in the USA, particularly in the Midwest where they basically use about 10 or 15 million tonnes a year of ammonia to direct drill into the ground to make their corn grow. So they've just got ammonia everywhere, so social licence is not such a problem there. But anyway, we'll talk a bit about that later on. So we all know that ammonia is everywhere, so it's a naturally occurring um, substance. Uh, we have background levels in air, water, soil. Um, obviously, you know, if, if, if you haven't produced 17 milligrams, microgram, milligrams, of ammonia today, which will be discharged from your body, then, you know, there's something wrong. Um, so it's everywhere. So I guess that means we shouldn't really be scared of it. Uh, so some time ago, this uh, AGL or acute exposure guideline levels were introduced into the American um, system and that is sort of really advanced worldwide globally. It's a very uh, well accepted global um, uh, ex you know, levels for assessment of um, ammonia concentrations. So what we have is uh, Agle 1, 2 and 3. So Agle 1, you can see there that uh, over time Agle 1 is consistently at 30. So 30 is what we Generally, 25 to 30 ppm concentration of ammonia in air is accepted as what we, what we commonly call the TLV, so um, the threshold limit value. The threshold limit value is defined as uh, the level at which the average person can work in. So you can work 40 hours a week, uh, 48 weeks a year in uh, uh, that sort of level. So that's the threshold limit value. In Australia it's listed, it varies a little bit from country to country. In Australia it's listed at 25, uh, the US is 30. So it's always in that zone, no matter where you are in Asia or Europe or whatever. That's the threshold limit value. So that's Agle 1. Agle 1 means minor exposure, low exposure with no long-term, no possibility of any long-term effects. Agle 2 is moderate exposure, so you can see there that for 10 minutes you're up to 220 um, and then after 8 hours you're down to 110, that's sort of moderate exposure. Um, and then of course Agle 3 is acute exposure where, where um, it's uh, very dangerous and uh, um, needs to be uh, coped with or you know, avoided at all costs. So the reason why the emergency response community um, look at AGLE 3 is that assessment of AGLE 3, if they've got someone who's been exposed uh, at, at an AGLE 3 level for 60 minutes at 1100 ppm, um, in their vernacular, they're looking at a body retrieval rather than a rescue. So they're, they're the sort of things that they talk about. <clears throat> so that's acute exposure. So ASTI has a lot of different programs, a lot of different aspects to the operations of ASTI and it varies a little bit from continent to continent, but um, the, the base level that we run, uh, what we call safety day, so that's a full day Full day training for those uh, three different uh, groups that we talked about. Um, then we do a lot of live release training, which I'll show you some uh, in, um, examples of that shortly. Do a lot of tabletop exercises for all kinds of organisations. We do joint training exercises with uh, other um, emergency response groups, the police and uh, um, you know, SES, uh, you know, all of the, 
all of those sort of people as well as the um, industry. So also develop a lot of site-specific emergency response plans, which are quite different. Um, an, an ammonia release emergency response plan is quite different to, for instance, a fire, fire plan. Um, the main thing being that uh, usually the best way to um, cope with uh, uh, even a large-scale ammonia release is to what we call shelter in place. Uh, and if the building's on fire, you don't shelter in place. You can get out of the place. So, but in many occasions with large ammonia releases we've seen around the world, um, it's best to shelter in place, stay in the building, stay in a safe area, rather than trying to make a run for it. So technical and PPE reviews of, of sites or uh, facilities. Um, so we do work in the statutory code of practice development. We've worked in Australia on a number of those. Um, uh, ASTI also have introduced in the last couple of years what they call the one plan response. And the one plan response covers all kinds of emergencies. Um, not, not just ammonia, it could be all kinds of different emergencies, you know, from various chemicals, um, even, even down to chlorine. So, you know, they can apply the one plan response to that. And it's all to do with the, the, um, the, the, way, the, the way they set up to cope with those sort of emergencies. Um, I also do the cooperative research agreements with, uh, between industry and the government that's trade as an American thing, but um, you know we work with uh, on crater projects, uh, on dispersion modelling, and all kinds of other things. And then we also have uh, literature for the general public. So that's all about social licence. So this is uh, just some shots that I took uh, off my uh, <laughs> camera roll, my my list of photos. Um, you can see that, uh, how do we get this pointer to work? Let's press the laser, the red laser. Oh yeah, okay. So on these photos, um, th these are live releases. So that live release there, which we, we, we run these at various approved uh, locations. You don't want to sort of do this anywhere. Um, and, uh, that, that, that live release there is, um, a liquid, saturated liquid under pressure, uh, around about 500 kilograms a minute, and it's creating that sort of uh, aerosol and dense gas cloud. Um, and then, you know, they'll do a tarp and cover exercise. So the best way to knock that down is to is to put a tarp uh, tarp over it. And what that does, it knocks it down. You can see that it's knocked it down completely, so that now that will all of that liquid coming out of there will re-form um, as liquid on the ground. So you have it there, so you won't have this atmospheric problem that you've got. And this is just uh, one of the, um, you know, some, the, the safety days and the 32-hour live release programs we also run in the uh, local uh, fire brigade or, you know, emergency response uh, um, facility. So uh, we're in the firehouse there. So ASTI has a lot of literature and a lot of quick guides, which um, are just, just that's a, a few examples of uh, the quick guides. And they, those uh, coloured playbooks all relate to our first 30, the, the 30 minute plan, which I can uh, uh, maybe go through with you. So <clears throat> this is the 30 minute plan. It just gives you the very stages of what, what you do in an emergency. Um, you've got the discovery stage, the initial response, uh, sustained response, and then the uh, termination. So there's pretty much standard um, approaches, but there's a lot of information there, and those various coloured playbooks give you a lot more detail. So this is some of the literature that we have that's suitable for the public. Um, just a quick uh, anecdote about some of this literature. So this has been, actually have been... Uh, 
publishing this for many years. Um, and uh, there's an example of uh, uh, Ashti running a program at a facility, an ammonia refrigerated facility uh, in the suburbs. Uh, and uh, they, ran the, they, they ran the program there, made sure that uh, they were aware of these trifold brochures that we have. Um, and the safety manager for that facility really took it all on board. And uh, after that program, she uh, managed to get hold of a whole bunch of those brochures, particularly the living near anhydrous ammonia one. And she uh, took it on herself to go out and start distributing the brochures to all the neighbours within about a two kilometre radius of the facility. This is going back probably 20 years or more. Uh, and then her management from the facility found out what she was doing because, you know, she just took it on herself to do it, which wasn't that bad. And uh, so they dragged her into the office and said, what are you doing, you know? You're around with all our neighbours, scaring them with all this literature. Um, so she got a, you know, got a complete dressing down um, and uh, obviously very upset about that, about what she'd done and all the rest of it. So a couple of weeks after that happened, they had a minor, relatively minor ammonia incident at the facility, uh, which they, which they uh, responded to very well and covered off, made it, you know, closed, shut it down and did everything, but it did allow some ammonia to get out into the community, some, you know, odours, smells, um, but, you know, it was a fairly low level exercise. Um, and then about a week after that low level exercise, the um, president or managing director of the company um, asked the lady, the safety officer for the company, into his office. And she thought, oh, no, you know, that's it, I'm, I'm gone. He's going to sack me. So in she went. And he said, uh, I have to apologise to you. He said, since that incident, we've had a number of phone calls from our neighbours thanking us for giving them the literature and information prior to anything happening. So they knew what to do. And they knew that at those low levels, it wasn't going to hurt them. And they knew, you know, they just did with instructions, go inside, close the doors and windows, and then, uh, you know, let it, let it all subside. And uh, so he had a number of responses came into their company by those neighbours. So he um, apologised to her and uh, asked her to go ahead and finish her distribution of the literature. So I thought, what a fabulous story. So it was a, a transition from the old thinking, you know, oh, we can't tell anyone what we're doing and, you know, we've got dangerous materials here. Please don't say anything to anyone. It'll just panic them. Across now to this new, you know, paradigm that we're in where, you know, transparency is the name of the game. We've got to make sure they know. So that, that encouraged Asti greatly, that little story. So now I want to talk to you about uh, <clears throat> the risk and hazard level associated with various kinds of accidental releases. So now I hope this doesn't frighten you too much, but this is just a pH diagram. So all we have here is um, a pH diagram for ammonia. And on that scale, the vertical scale, we have uh, pressure. And on the horizontal scale, we basically have heat content, or enthalpy, we call it, but it's heat content. And uh, every material um, that you know, exists in uh, the, the gas and liquid phase, we have this envelope. And that's like a dryness fraction envelope. Uh, on the, that side, we have a saturated vapour line. On this side, we have the saturated liquid line. So the most dangerous forms of accidental ammonia releases are from liquid. 
and they will come from somewhere along this line here. So if, if they're at atmospheric pressure, which is 0 0.1 MPA, this line across here, um, they'll be from 0.2. If the, if the liquid that is uh, released into the accidental release is from an atmospheric pressure tank, it's sitting there at that point too, which is at minus 33 degrees C. Um, <clears throat> if it's from a pressurised vessel, which I'll go through those with you in a moment, uh, it'll be saturated liquid under pressure. And I'll just use the example here of 30 something degrees at point five. So I just want to study with you those two different scenarios as far as <clears throat> those releases go. So these are the types of containment systems that we tend to use for ammonia. Um, so all of these, including the rail cars, they hold about 50 or 60 tonnes each. The road tanker, probably 20. Barges, you know, they, they hold a lot. Um, nurse tanks, usually two tonne and five tonne nurse tanks, which, uh, you know, they use in agriculture. These are all that 0.5. They're, they're all saturated liquid under pressure because they're at ambient temperature. So they're somewhere up that line, up that saturated liquid line, the, all of those. Now the pipeline, yeah, similar because it, they're so long and that, that's just a shot of the pipeline in the Midwest of America. It's 5,000 kilometre pipeline with 45 terminals on it, 45 um, terminal tank terminals on it. And this is a picture of a of a uh, ship and a shore-based terminal. There's my little model of the ship, <laughs> ammonia tanker. Um, so this is really the only situation where we're holding it at uh, point 0.2, which is saturated liquid at atmospheric pressure, minus 33 degrees in this ship and in these shore-based tanks and in all of those tanks around that pipeline, all of those um, terminals. All the, everything else is at pressure. So the first thing we need to look at is 0.5. You know, we're up, we're, we've got saturated liquid under pressure. So release under pressure results in an aerosol and potentially a dense gas cloud. We saw that in the training program, in that live release training. That's, a, that's an aerosol and dense gas cloud. So on the pH diagram, the example shows the pressure reduction uh, at the point of release goes vertically down from 0.5 to 0.4, arriving at atmospheric pressure at a dryness fraction of 0.22. So that means, and that's, I'll show you the video in a moment. Um, that means we can estimate 22% of the mass flow of the release will instantaneously turn to flash gas in the breach. The volume ratio of gas to liquid and ammonia at those conditions is about 700 and something. So that means in the example, one litre per second of liquid releasing will generate 168 litres per second of flash gas which violently propels the aerosol and then becomes the dense gas cloud, which will be heavier than air. Um, and this, this kind of release does pose the highest risk. So this is what you get. So that's a liquid release. Now, can anyone think why, given that ammonia gas is around about 0.7, the density of air, why would that 
aerosol and dense gas cloud just hang down on the ground like that. Why do you think it's heavier than air? Even coal gas is 0.7. What do you think you're looking at when you look at that? You can see that cloud. What are you looking at? Pardon? Yeah, liquid what? Liquid water. So the cold attracts, obviously, moisture out of the air. And it, you just end up with this... So what you're seeing is actually the moisture. So you've got a mixture of ammonia gas, ammonia liquid droplets, water droplets, or yeah, water vapour, and the whole thing combines together to be quite, you know, it's about the same or slightly heavier maybe than, than air. So that's why you end up with that sort of horrendous cloud. How do I get that to play again? And I mean that, that's a five tonne nurse tank. Um, but you can see it just filled the whole valley. Just, just lays there. And at any point in that cloud, you're talking at least 20,000 ppm, which is, you just don't want to be there. And none of the emergency response people we train, doesn't matter whether they've got level A gear on, they'll never go into a visible cloud. Never. You just never do that. So here's a case study of uh, a problem that occurred with regard to saturated ammonia release. 2002, Minot, North Dakota. 250 tonnes. They had five rail cars ruptured, 50 tonnes each. 250 tonnes was released in a cloud. It lay over the city. I think it was more than several hours. It lay, there's a city of 15,000 people. Lay over the city. Dispatchers told residents, the dispatchers, you know, they call 911. Everyone's calling 911 because they could smell ammonia. Um, dispatchers referred to a World War II handbook. This is a big advantage with ammonia. We all know. <laughs> We've known for a century. And the World War II handbook told them to close the windows and doors, use wet cloths over your mouth if you're, if you're suffering a bit. Uh, go into the bathroom, turn the shower on. You don't have to get in the shower. Just turn the shower on, close the doors, put towels and blankets around the doors, turn the shower on and just let it run down the drain. And it will... And when, after that happened in Minot, our ASTI colleagues said, oh, yeah, they looked at the World War II manual they were using and they said, oh, you know, we'll do our own experiment on how good that is. So we did a bunch of experiments with bathrooms and turning the shower on and all that. And it's fabulous. It just worked a treat. So if you're in there and you've got 300 ppm, you're all in the bathroom, turn the shower on. Very rapidly, we plotted it all. Very rapidly, it'll pull it down below 30. And people just were fine. Now we did have... Sorry, we did have... Um, one fatality from that Minot event. And sadly, that was someone who made a break for it. They didn't stay in the house, didn't go in the bathroom, didn't do any of that. They got in their car and tried to make a run. And they didn't make it, sadly. And we had 14 other serious injuries. So, yeah, that was, that was probably the biggest... Um, you know, ammonia problem that they had. Well, that's just that's just a shot I had of a. That, that's in South America. That was a uh, a um, ammonia transport ship, ammonia cargo ship, coming into port. And apparently, the, the, we're still not totally clear on the story. But the story goes that one of the crew opened the wrong valve inside the vessel and. Uh, it stayed open for about five or ten minutes before they managed to shut it down. 
and that's what they ended up with. That's a bit of a dense gas cloud going on there. Yeah, that was that was that one. So that's a little bit about that. Okay, so um, now we'll go to so that was point five to four. What you saw there was the pressurised release at point five down to four. So that's and the dryness fraction. You can see the the flash gas quantity is twenty two percent. So now we'll talk about the uh, Point two. Release of saturated liquid atmospheric pressure. So what you do is, um, that's point two, the majority of the gas evaporating from the pool will be invisible. So it's pure gas, it hasn't got a whole bunch of liquid or moisture vapour, water vapour mixed with it. And it, well, it's saying that's about 60% of the density of air, so it quickly rises in the atmosphere. And there will be no aerosol no, or no dense gas cloud, and therefore the risk is obviously much lower. So in the ASTI vernacular, when you have a pool of liquid lying on the ground like that, it basically it goes to sleep, we say. It goes to sleep. It, it becomes far less dangerous, far less aggressive. Um, it, it, it basically sleeps. You get a little bit of wisping. You can see a bit of wisping going on from the surface of the pool. We don't spray water anywhere near it, you know, which is something that we have to, treat, to teach all of the firemen. You know, firemen love to spray water. And when you come across an ammonia problem, don't spray water, guys. You, all you'll do is stir that up and create a dense gas cloud. So that is basically boil-off gas. So you've got heat coming into the pool and it's boiling a little bit of gas off. The inflow of ammonia has stopped at the one ton level. Surface ripples are due to wind action. The servers are moving over the field and activating the sampling bottles. They are equipped with canister gas masks and are now determining the size and shape of the ammonia vapor cloud. Which of those? As they walk slowly into the test range, they lift a corner of the masks and sniff the air. <laughs> the point where they first detect ammonia odour is marked by driving a stake into the ground. By computing gauge readings against measured time intervals, the evaporation rate is calculated at 6.8 pounds per hour per square foot. Because of this low evaporation rate, the vapour spread has been neither very extensive nor is the concentration very strong. An observer near the 150 foot marker is still unable to detect the edge of the vapour cloud. At the 50-foot marker, this man is checking detector tubes and restarting any that have failed. He carries his mask and is experiencing no apparent discomfort. So he's like from here to the corner away from that pool, no problem. So most of that is just going up. Most of that clear gas is going up. So which scenario would you rather be in? <laughs> so case study two this is a Port Neal in Iowa 1994 so this plant that's an ammonia storage facility the twin tanks there and you can see this L-shaped bun that's the, that's the bun for the ammonia tanks and uh, some little distance away, we have a separate facility on there, which is an ammonium nitrate plant. So they had a nitric acid plant there and they were making ammonium nitrate and this ammonia um, terminal was to feed their ammonium nitrate plant. So sadly, in 1994, December, they had an incident in the ammonium nitrate plant. So they ended up with a detonation. They're still... I read all the reports about you know exactly what that what you know what caused that it was part of their process somehow or other detonated some of the ammonium nitrate detonated nothing like Beirut but you know a small detonation but it 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 was enough it killed four people the detonation and it sent a shockwave across which ruptured one of those tanks 
and 5,700 tonnes of liquid ran out into the Bund. Biggest ammonia spill in American history. So in that bun, that was several feet deep of liquid, that bun. So the, all the emergency response people showed up. Obviously they'd been there, you know, to cope with the disaster from the ammonium nitrate plant. But they also had to figure out what to do with this uh, ammonia release. Um, but, you know, they, those tanks, are my, uh, minus 33 liquid tanks, so basically the 5,700 tonnes just ran out, more or less like water, <laughs> and filled up the bun, and you end up with a little bit of wispy boil-off like that. And most of the boil-off gas will be going straight up into the sky. They ended up, by virtue of their... Um, emergency response plan, they ended up evacuating 1,700 residents and there's factories and whatnot around there from the surrounding area, but there were no deaths or injuries as a result of the ammonia release. So, you know, that just gives a bit of contrast between something massive like that, which was very easily um, coped with, compared with what happened in Minot, you know, when you had a, a pressurised release. So yeah, that's all, all from point two. So there's a third one, which is sort of in between. So you end up point three. Now point three is um, a subcooled liquid release. So when you have uh, the storage tank, I showed you the picture of the ship pulled up beside the wharf with the storage tank. So if you've got a ship to shore load or unload going on, um, what they do is they just pump the liquid from either the tanks or the ship just using centrifugal pumps. And all those pumps do is they take this uh, saturated liquid at this point two and pressurise it up to point three. And then it goes through the pipes. So you end up, if you have a release from those pipes, um, it's at point three. So example, um, it goes from point three to point two. So little or no flash gas will form because you know it's, it's not coming down into the dryness fraction zone. It's just going straight back down to the saturated line. So that's just what I described. So it's a lower risk than a saturated liquid release. So the highest risk and hazard profile will be from the pressurised saturated ammonia liquid release at, in an enclosed space. And that's typically the refrigeration world. Everything we do is in an enclosed space, ipso facto. You know, we, all of our refrigeration is in cool rooms, cold stores, freezers, all kinds of different process freezers. The lowest risk and hazard will be from an atmospheric pressure storage of saturated liquid in an outdoor area. So that means as we expand the ammonia world dramatically, if it's all in, the, in that uh, atmospheric pressure storage, then uh, you know, the, the, the risk and hazard level to the world, to the public, to everybody, is not going to be just commensurate with uh, you know, what, what happens in the refrigeration industry or in the pressurised storage industry. So let's talk about PPE. Um, so there are pretty much three standard ranges of PPE that are used globally. Uh, and these are classified as level A, B and C. Um, level A is a, a gas tight suit that is worn over the top of the SCBA. And you see that there and they, this, this, these are uh, ASTI training exercises. You can see those silver guys are in level A. And, uh, you can see a guy there in level B. That's level A, which you're probably all familiar with. Level B, we got level B 
There's four of them hanging out there. There's four Scots Level B SCBAs hanging on the wall just outside there. But this is level B, level B with a disposable suit, so we just use a sort of Lakeland disposable suits like those ones. And you put the disposable suit on first um, and then put the SCBA system on over the top. So you can see the, the SCBA harness and everything goes over the top of the disposable suit and put the face mask on. So that's level B. You can see that level A was... Um, uh, concentrations above 5,000. Um, level, level B recommended between 300 and 5,000 ppm. Now level C is what we want to talk about today. Now level C is something that ASTI has introduced as the ASTI vest. So the ASTI vest um, is just a, a vest that is fully equipped and the, the principle of the ASTI vest is that it should be worn by people who are working in and around ammonia plants and we want them to wear it all the time so that they've got their PPE on them. So there have been too many cases where people will have their PPE and are outside the plant or you know, in their vehicle or whatever they're doing, depending on you know, whether they're a contractor or whatever, um, they have a bit of an incident going on. They've got a small release going on in their plant. So they rush out to get the ASTI vest. By the time they get back in, they can't get back. The level's up too high. So what we want them to do is use the PPE, have it on them so that they can um, cope with most things uh, with this sort of gear on. So... Uh, this, this is a full face or a single lens um, MSA um, which I'm not as happy with because it doesn't fit as well into the ASTI vest. So um, we prefer what's known as the Scots mask. Now these, these Scots um, dual lens masks are very easy to, to operate. Um, and really, you need to be clean shaven because this is a negative pressure device, so you're actually sucking in through the through the the uh, filter. And um, if you if you've got a heavy beard on, you're going to end up in a situation where you're, you're dragging the you know ammonia concentration or whatever through the through the sides, you know, through your beard. So ASTI has a pretty good um, system to figure out, you know, how the how the mask efficiency drops. So it's pretty easy to get on, and uh, you know, it allows you to uh, cope with most situations with regard to um, uh, uh, you know accidental ammonia releases. So. These, these, these are K2 filters. These filters come K1, K2, K3. The K2, um, it's tested up to 4,500 ppm for so many minutes. Um, so very effective, you know, been, been in very high concentrations um, with, with these on, even though uh, they're not strictly classified for levels above um, 300 ppm. So the other th items on the ASTI vest, uh, obviously the, we have um, ammonia lapel sensor. That'll give you the uh, level that you're working in. If you're in the sort of 300 range and you've got your um, filter mask on, you can always look and this thing will beep and tell you what the level is. Or you can look to see what the level is, and once it approaches, you know, you know, if you look down there, looking at over a thousand, even though you won't be able to smell it, you know, you you might you start making for the exit. <laughs> so that's helpful in that regard. Um, oh, the rest of the stuff. 
So we use uh, everything as per the list there. We've got the elbow length gloves. Um, we got goggles in case you're doing stuff that you know you don't really need the mask on. Um, you just use your um, UVX goggles. Uh, I guess an important thing is you've also got handy in one of these pockets. Um, it's a dipper tear in um, eye wash. So this uh, dipper tear in, you just break open eye wash. So if you do happen to get a problem with ammonia in your eyes, if you can get that into your eyes within a few seconds, which is why it needs to be on you, um, it, it's proven to be extremely good in you know, saving any problems with your eyes. Um, what else do we have? Oh, just a little torch. We've got anti-fog spray there because a lot of times in the refrigeration industry, we're dealing in cold storage. So, you know, you go in, you've got a problem in the cold store, got your gear on, you just spray the inside of the lenses with that anti-fog spray and it, it uh, saves you just fogging up as soon as you walk in the freeze. Not much good if you walk in the freeze when everything just fogs up and you uh, can't see where you're going. Um, we also, you know, in the in the ASCII vest situation, we have the, the thirty minute, just a thirty minute plan, which, you know, just to remind us of what we're doing. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. What's the time? Nine fifty-two. Oh, okay. Yeah, so. Yeah, um, the K2s are pretty good though, so there's a new K2 there. So we just make sure, usually you carry a spare, you know, that's, that's unwrapped. <laughs> so, and just, you know, that probably lasts, well, depending on how, how much you're using it. They do get saturated eventually if you're in heavy uh, concentration all the time. But um, like the average for, an average technician that's working in the refrigeration industry, you know, he'd probably replace it every year. It would last him a year. And this one's, I think, still going well. And he's had it that long, all his labels are worn off it. So, um, yeah, so <clears throat> every time, <clears throat> now I told you before that when ASTI was first formed in the refrigeration industry in the US, they were losing. 10 people a year. So in the last decade, they've had averaged one person per year. And every time they have a fatality and a tragedy, they get involved and they analyse the situation. And the, the, one of the questions they ask is, if, if he'd had his gear on, would the same result have occurred? And invariably, it's no, it would not have occurred. If, if he'd had his gear on. So that's why they're encouraging everyone to get their gear on. Now, this uh, ensemble, as we see it, I mean, it, we, used, we used to supply them with a Crocon detector, which are a brilliant detector, but very expensive. But with the um, Honeywell, I'm not sure, but you're talking 12 or 1500 bucks, I think. I'd stand corrected on that, but you know, to me, to give the guys, you know, a two thousand dollar PPE set, you know, to me, it's just very cost effective and worthwhile. Because it could save their lives. Now, in Australia, we we've had. Um, One death in the last 70 years in the refrigeration industry from ammonia. I'm not sure about the fertiliser industry. I don't think they've had any. So it's possible that with all ammonia-related injuries and deaths, I think there's been one in the last 70 years. So we don't, you know, but 
Ashley still investigates every, every uh, you know, release. Um, in Canada a few years ago, they had three fatalities in Fernie in uh, British Columbia, just, just, uh, just up in Canada there. Um, and they were, that was an ice rink. But it was, yeah, it was a very, you know, they had a lot of warning signs on that plant and uh, no one did anything about it and eventually it killed three people. So, but uh, the, I think the, the very day that happened, our, our ASTI guys from uh, Washington State were up there within, within a day and they, they were called on by the, the British Columbia authorities to come and help. So they went up and investigated, provided the report and everything. But yeah, no, it was very, very sad, that one. Um, all right. So any other questions or thoughts or <laughs> about all of this? <laughs> Yeah, so, yep, it's exactly right. Ammonia and water have a huge affinity with each other and that also um, comes to light in the decon, decon process that we need to undertake if anyone gets ammonia liquid on their skin, um, they need to be properly deconned and what that involves is, is irrigating with water for 15 to 20 minutes not five minutes, not two minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, because they don't know what the, what the ammonia has done that's penetrated into their skin. So you've got to keep irrigating and irrigating, get it all out. And if it's, if it, if it's irrigated for 20 minutes, there's a very good chance that there'll be really no skin problems. And that's all to do with the affinity. Oh, you mean you mean from the nine one one, the dispatcher? Yeah, um, wouldn't matter what, whatever. Just turn, yeah, turn the cold shower on; it works fine. But with the decon, the water temperature is very important. So, you know, you've probably seen shower and eye washes on facilities. So that that is the first port of call. But if you've got to keep a person under that shower and shower to decontaminate them if they've had ammonia on their body or whatever, um, you really need to get them to a, a tepid shower. You don't want, you know, 15 degree water running over for 20 minutes, they'll end up with hypothermia. So, and they won't stand for it, they'll be wanting to get out of it, and, but they don't realise that it's, you know, it's got to, got to draw the ammonia out of their skin. Sorry. The safety standard. Um, What's uh, you mean the volume of ammonia? What at what scale do the standards start to kick in? Is it kilograms, tons? At what at what scale does what? At what scale do the safety standards start to kick in? Is it kilograms, tons, hundreds of tons? Um, well, that's probably more to do with the facility design standards and the safety standards. So it uh, varies a lot. But as far as the training for ASTI goes, we, <clears throat> um, a, a, a release of a kilogram can create a problem. If I let a kilogram go in here, especially an aerosol, you'd all be out the door real quick, I can tell you. So I'm about to open up a 2% solution there. So any scale for, for the ASTI training. Um, but as far as the, the safety standards and everything for the facilities go, usually in most places um, it's either just a conventional um, safety systems until you get to MHF. So once you go to major hazard facility, the whole thing changes again. 
In America, they have um, various other um, PMP and uh, other safety uh, things that kick in, and they kick in at uh, 10,000 pounds, if you can convert that. So if your facility's got 10,000 pounds and above in it, then you have a different, um, but that varies from country to country. Yeah. If you do have a leak, a liquid leak, do they actively try and get the liquid out of the, the, <coughs> by, by the bomb working? Oh, yeah. yeah, yep. So what they did there on that one at Port Neal, that was the one where they had the two, I think they were about 15,000 tonne tank each, uh, and 5,700 had run out of one tank. They were connected together with pipes, as you'd imagine, um, to fill them and, uh, you know, discharge. And there was a valve in between the two tanks, um, and that was open. So the problem was it was still running out, so they were in danger of emptying the other tank out of the bund as well. But they already had a couple of feet of liquid in the bund, so... What they did was they suited up, they had a couple of guys suited up in level A, which you'd need, um, and they put them in a boat and they paddled across the lake and got to the valve and shut the valve and paddled back successfully because they were very worried. They didn't want to fall out in the ammonia. ammonia because the other thing about level A suits is the standard level A suit's only good for about um, minus 40. Now, the liquid is probably minus 33, but the um, vapour can be colder. So you have to be careful. So we've had situations where people are in a standard level A suit and they might go in and be doing, you know, something like trying to close a valve. And we've had situations where the liquid was running down his arm of his suit and, he, and the suit froze up on him. And he knows, you know, the, the guy's pretty smart. He knew his suit had frozen on him. And that meant if he moved his arm, it would probably crack the suit open and woof. So they were coming out of the door, and I've got videos of them coming out of the door like this, you know, trying to make sure they didn't crack their suit. But the Swedes have low temperature suits. They're the only ones in the world. But they're very expensive, like 10 grand a suit. So hardly any people use them. Yeah, so, um, and then they'll pump, they'll put submersible pumps in and pump the liquid back. You know, and they've, they've done that here in Australia as well. Hey, John. Yep. Um, it's up to 10.03 now, so uh, we should probably do our demo and then get to morning tea, if that's all right. So, just this one. Um, so, what ASTI are doing is, uh, in conjunction with the Australian Maritime College in Launceston, part of UTAS, um, they're our only maritime college. They train uh, uh, mariners. In all, they've got all kinds of different training programs for mariners. They have a lot of overseas mariners come in for training into um, Launceston. So we've been talking with them for well, a year or two. Uh, and we, what we want to do is um, start to develop uh, Courses, a lot of it revolving around safety, of course. Um, courses for seafarers and uh, you know bunker workers, bunkering fuel workers, dock workers, um, for you know those who are crewing um, ships powered by ammonia. So we've heard a lot at this conference about how how quickly the ships are going to be up there, but we need to have people trained. You know, we need to have the crews trained in ammonia because it's going to be quite different. Um, so that's just a call for expressions of interest. So if anybody um, would like to support the development of those courses um, or uh, certainly have any interest in them, please contact either myself or uh, Hossein. Hossein's the main man at... Uh, at uh, the AMC. And of course, the, the courses will all be AMSA approved, you know, as, as are all other courses.
So yeah, I'll leave that with you. So mm -hmm. any other questions or thoughts? How can we thank John, please? <laughs> and are you going to do a live small release of Ammonia now? Um, well, is it, does any, everyone know what Ammonia smells like? Is anyone keen to know what Ammonia <laughs> smells like? <laughs> anyway. This, do it. You know, we, 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 we can use this stuff for cleaning, but it's 2% Ammonia in water solution. Um, so, and you'll get uh, above that, uh, out of that top, probably oh. two or three thousand ppm. This thing starts beeping at 25, you know, the Australian uh, TLV. So, what's it picking up? Got to wake it up first. Is there we go. Else picking that up, or is it just me? It's really, it's really acrid. Yeah. So we got six. That'll go to twenty-five in a minute. So having the sort of having this meter, it helps everybody. You know, so we know that we're in you know, relatively safe concentrations. So that's 35. And once it gets to 300, it should have a different, but I won't take it up to 300. Once it drops below 25, it'll sh shut up. So... If you're interested in smelling it, I definitely um, advise coming down the front and just doing a little circle. You can definitely, as you, well, like those guys with the mask, you can actually... But it's only, it's only cloudy ammonia. It's just what you, it's what you wash the floor with. And I mean, you know, we can, if you want to, you can put the mask on and do a test put yet in there and <laughs> you won't be able to smell it. If you wanted to smell it, the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I could have uh, asked you to evacuate rather than do this. So, yeah, no, it's all right. So, all good. So, all good. thank you very much. Any other questions, please come and see me or whatever to discuss. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>